actually Jericho. About three years ago, I was working on my project in Jordan. And when I got done, I got onto a great big airplane there in Mon, and I was flying back to Rome and on to Chicago with an overnight in Rome. And as I got on the airplane, I'm typing away on an archaeological article on my computer, my laptop. And I've got, the, in the article, I have some pictures of archaeological sites, in Jordan in this case. Sitting right next to me, there's 325 people on the airplane. The guy sitting right next to me on the airplane also has his laptop off. Uh, and he's typing away, and I could see out of the corner of his eye, you know, my eye, I could see it was an archaeological article, because there were pictures of sites coming up, including Jericho, okay? So I thought, this guy's, yeah, he's not just a tourist, he's really into this. So we typed quietly next to each other for 45 minutes, and I could see he's looking at my screen, too, you know? <laughs> and finally, after about 45 minutes, he can't take it first one to crack and he says who are you anyway <laughs> are you an archaeologist mm -hmm. and I said yes and he, well who are you and I said I'm professor Yonka from Andrews and I direct the excavations at Jalul and Jordan and I said who are you and he said well I'm professor Lorenzo Negro from the University of Rome and he had a dig there but also he directs the uh, dig at Jericho okay oh, he was the director at the time the Italians I actually had a chance to dig the site many years ago through the Palestinian Authority, but I was too hooked into my project there, so I didn't come here and he came here. Oh. So we're sitting on the plane, so we talk, he gives me from his computer his research, and I, so I put it on my computer, he's very nice, you know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so we visited for about three hours, and we're coming into Rome, and he says, well, what are you doing in Rome? And I said, well, I'm staying overnight, and then I fly on to Chicago. He says, no, you're not. You're coming to my home in Rome. Aww. So I went to his house near the University of Rome. He gave me pizza. I met his children. Fortunately, they liked me, so I was really a good, because I told American jokes. And then he took me that night to the museum in Rome at the university. So we're now good friends, and he was just giving a conference paper in Boston last November and about his research here at Jericho. The interesting thing about that was he admitted for the first time in his excavations that they found evidence of late Bronze Age occupation. Now why is it interesting? One of the big debates about Jericho uh, is again, did the story has the Bible describes it really happened Did the Israelites march. And this is by the way, we're standing on Tel Es Sultan. This is the Old Testament Jericho. And if you didn't hear me at the beginning, there's at least four Jerichos. There's the modern Palestinian Jericho. There's an Islamic Jericho not too far away, beautiful palaces, mosaics, and everything. There's New Testament Jericho, which is that direction that Jesus visited. Herod the Great, smart man, because he had his winter palace down here. Uh, I'm sorry, his summer palace down here, which is cool. Uh, so uh, it's a good place to be in the winter. I'm sorry, am I getting that right? The summer palace is in the bed, come down here in the winter. Got it. I said that wrong, I'm tired. Anyway, so then there's the Old Testament Jericho right here, okay? Now, this particular site uh, is thought to be, and probably correctly so, the oldest occupied city in history. It was the first founded city, even older than Mesopotamia, which is the oldest civilization. Um, archaeologists, of course, or scholars, Bible scholars, have been intrigued. I've got a book in my library that says, if Jericho did not fall, if the walls did not fall, is our faith in vain? And scholars have you know, for over a hundred years wondered, did this story really happen? The first archaeologists to come here were a couple of Austrians, Karl Botzinger and Ernst Zellen, okay? They came here and they dug a few pits around here and there, and they didn't find anything particularly conclusive, and they were a little bit negative on the results of whether the Joshua story really took place. Then after that, a British guy came, not trusting the Austrians, because they hang out with Germans and Ottomans. <laughs> and so they came to check it out for themselves. His name was John Garstang. And he did more excavations here, and he found a series of cities built on top one of another. By the way, you all heard what tell means, right? Yeah. A tell is a hill of occupation, ancient <laughs> occupational debris. And often we'll find layers of cities buried one on top of the other. So John Garstang found one city that intrigued him. He called it city number four. And it seemed to have a wall that went around it. And according to his dating, it dated to about the time of the biblical exodus. He dated it like Siegfried Horn does to about the 15th century, around 1445 BC. And he announced to the world that he had proof that the Bible story was true. 
and everybody got very excited back in the 1930s. To make sure he wasn't just making this up, he asked another British scholar to come check his work. Her name, very famous in archaeological circles, was Dame Kathleen Kenyon. She came here in the 50s. Now, uh, Dame Kathleen Kenyon, this gets into a little bit of politics. Some people think that she was a little bit anti-Jewish and pro-Palestinian even back then. But anyway, she dug here. She was a very good archaeologist, and she found City 4, but she announced to the world that John Garstang was completely wrong, that City 4 dated to the Middle Bronze Age before Joshua, before Moses, before the Israelites could have come around here. So that the whole story that John Garstang confirmed is false, okay? <laughs> so that was kind of disappointing. After that, a scholar by the name of Bryant Woods in the United States, he went and looked at uh, Kathleen Kenyon's pottery, and he said she made some mistakes and that the Middle Bronze Age pottery she dated was actually some of a Late Bronze Age. And so he said there is evidence of people living here at the time of the conquest. So the Bible is true again. Okay, so you got it not true, true, not true, true, and it goes on. The most recent uh, excavator was my friend Lorenzo Negro. He's come here and he refound city number four. And we're going to see some of the revetment wall of that quite impressive. He came to the conclusion that Kenyon was right and Bryant Wood was wrong. So the Jericho is gone again. There's no city from the time of the Exodus. And then a few weeks ago he admitted that we found some stuff he found some stuff from the late Bronze Age. There are some things in the area such as tombs that are associated with Jericho. And these tombs have scarabs in them and this is a uh, a contentious issue, but the scarabs have names of Egyptian pharaohs, including, and for those of you who are Adventists, and remember Siegfried Horn's commentary on the Exodus, in the Seventh-day Adventist commentary, he talks about a possible pharaoh, this is totally different from most scholars, he said maybe the pharaoh of the Exodus was Amenhotep II, Bill Shea come along and said maybe there's a co-regency between Amenhotep II and Thutmose III, and that the actual mother of Moses was Hatshepsut. So if you were in my class years ago, I would have told you about that. The interesting thing was when they found these seals back in uh, Kenyon's day, the names of these very people are on the seals. Hatshepsut, that Moses III, and Amenhotep II. So you have the circumstantial evidence. It's still contentious. Two famous Israeli scholars, they didn't get into a fight with Kenyon, but they said, look, even if the city was Middle Bronze Age, like Kenyon said, it's possible that the Middle Bronze Age city walls continue to be used into the Late Bronze Age, so maybe there's some validity to the story anyway. That was Yagil Yadin, and more recently, Amahai Mazar in his textbook on archaeology also says there's a possibility that that city continued to be lived into to the time of the Exodus and the conquest. So the story is still contentious, people are still debating. Lorenzo Negro is still continuing to activate, but it's a site of very, very great interest. But I always remind people at the end of the day, it's archaeologists will do their thing. Sometimes the evidence looks good, sometimes it looks contradictory. You have to decide as pastors and believers what you're going to believe and how you relate to the Word of God. Ultimately, it's a faith position, isn't it? And so it doesn't really matter what science says at the end of the day. It's your personal belief and your personal relationship with God. So uh, I'm perfectly, uh, I'm not bothered by the challenges. We continue to explore it. I'm perfectly comfortable think this is the right site. And something happened here. We're still trying to sort it out, so we continue to dig. So that's sort of a summary of it. The site itself, Kenyon did find something very important. For the oldest city, there's a trench just right over here to my right, to your left, or depending where you're standing, but you'll see a tower down there, and that's one of the, that's part of one of the oldest cities in the world. It goes back uh, to prehistoric times, actually. There's a, there was a uh, Neolithic city here, pre-pottery Neolithic, and then pottery Neolithic. Uh, we're talking about kind of Stone Age stuff, and an interesting question is how to fit that all in, but it's down below the Jericho of the Bible times. So she found the oldest city in the world, and then she found a series of layers. There's even evidence for abandonment after the city was occupied in the Old Testament time, which fits the story of Judges, Ehud the prophet, he gets, you know, uh, the uh, uh, judge comes along, stabs him in the belly. And there's actually a building here that seems to fit the descriptions of the Bible, the palace of the Moabite king who lived here. So anyway, there's about three or four areas where you can see some of the exposure. There are signs there. Our guides will be glad to explain uh, what's going on in those and I'll be around to answer questions too. So we'll look at the site, we'll kind of work our way back down and then there's going to be a um, 
the Waffle Lunch. Because any before we break, any questions? Was that yeah? I remember. I think in class you talking about how big the city of Jericho would have been. Yeah. When Joshua and I was just astounded at how small it, it was. It small. just goes yeah, to that hill right over there, down to where you walked up. This is not a, biblical not cities are not huge by modern standards. People live much closer together. It's much more compact, so you have to adjust your ideas of space and uh, private space and how many people you like to have around you. Uh, coming in, we noticed, you know, somebody said to notice how the houses here in the Arab section are unfinished because they always add another floor for family as they grow. In Bible times, it was even more that way. You crowded everybody in and you had families living, and if you did have to make more space, you built it right next to her ma and pa or aunt and uncle live. So they had very close quarter family relations, very compact population densities. Yeah. What about, uh, I remember some time past hearing that excavations that somebody had made the claim that the walls of Jericho had fallen flat. There is some evidence from Bryant Wood's analysis of Kenyon's dig that there was a mud brick wall in City 4 that went all the way around the city and there is evidence it all collapsed downhill on top of a stone rampart. I'm glad you reminded me of that. We'll see the rampart recently excavated in Lorenzo Negro's excavations. And so according to Bryant Woods, that it, those are the walls that came tumbling down. Uh, it, whether they're Middle Bronze Age or Late Bronze Age, they are dramatic and they do seem to fit the story. Uh, now there are people, I should add one more thing, I don't want to keep you here too long, but there are people that say the Exodus and Congress took place in the 13th century, the 1200s, so they have a problem with all of this discussion we're having. They say hey, it happened 200 years later, nothing fits. And then you have another group of scholars, and this is just to keep you aware as pastors, they say there was no exodus, no conquest at all. And they suggest that rather the Israelites never were in Egypt except maybe a small group. Most of the Israelites were Canaanites, and they, there was sort of a socio-economic revolt around the 13th century, and they overthrew their Canaanite overlords. A few people came up from Egypt, told them this incredible story of how they escaped the Pharaoh, and they said, hey, that's a good idea. What's the name of your God, Yahweh? Okay, that's our God too. So most of the Israelites were really converted Canaanites, and that's what, what they call an indigenous theory. So, And there's variations on that, many variations, and the scholars spend their time fighting and arguing over that. So you, you have the historical tradition of the Bible, and then you have scholars trying to make this fit with the various data they see. And these are the ideas that are floating out there. Yeah. Which direction would, it, would the Israelites have come from? They would have come from the Jordan River, which is right behind you over there, you know, not far from John the Baptist's site, actually. <laughs> So there's a pillar there. No, there's nothing you can see there where they cross. They, the Bible talks about a pillar being set over there to remind the Israelites on this side that they left two and a half tribes on that side. But it'd be approximately that area where the miraculous crossing of the Jordan River took place. Mm -hmm.